Hello everyone, today we talk about 10th century Bohemia, making a very concise political and military history of the duchy, because that what it was at the beginning, from its origins to the definitive consolidation at the beginning of the 11th century, and in relation especially with other powers, such as Great Moravia and Eastern Francia. And uh, in this peculiar moment of um, European history that saw the emergence, the consolidation, in fact, of these powers in Central Europe that were not important just for local history of these peoples, uh, but also for the future of European history, as you know, uh, Bohemia would rise to, 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 to the kingdom, essentially, and uh, incorporated within the Holy Roman Empire in, in the 14th century especially would reach this moment of greatest splendor especially from, from a cultural point of view um, as the, the heart of um, 14th century Europe as a matter of fact we also made a video about it it is pretty old and uh, somewhat also inaccurate for certain uh, information but we will make it uh, once again uh, at some point because this is this is actually a chapter that deserves a lot but i think the history of the origin of these mm, formations is particularly important because um it makes you understand how uh fluid the system was at the beginning this broader slavic area that had seen a precarious consolidation under certain specific dynasties the permissions in the case uh, of of the czechs uh, specifically and that um, eventually would progressively structure and rise to, to become a, you know, very important um, uh, entities and um, also with continuity with pre-existing settlements and traditions Bohemia was not born just with the, the Permisled dynasty of course it had as we'll see it now just also for geographical and economical reasons certain continuities with the past but it's nevertheless very significant that um, these powers managed to 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 merge successfully right from a situation where there basically had never been uh, there a monarchy before like uh, we we mean it uh, chiefly from from kind of a feudal perspective that here was still yet to come but the nucleus of bohemian power and this capability also of extending around over other um, communities is quite remarkable and not to be given for granted right because what we will see today is essentially how the system got shaped especially uh, considering the mm, political background of the surrounding powers that were leaving in fact uh, in their in turn like their own consolidation um, so giving a very sketchy picture of what we're talking about we we have to contextualize the, the rise of bohemia from the uh the disgregation of the great moravia that as you know was this power that substantially emerged from the uh, from in turn of the disgregation of the other Kaganate, uh, the hands of the Carolingians, that had kept the surrounding Slavic populations as subjects and uh, you know living in this mm, being centered as a power in the Pannonian plain, but having all around um, in these more mountainous and forested uh, terrains, the, the Slavic tribes, paying tribes, but also being fairly fairly autonomous so great moravia filled the, that gap uh, by, by a certain standard in this region um, uh, of central europe that never quite reached a kind of a level degree of regional power like for example bulgaria had done in the south um, and it was a, an unstable area in the first place that had that also the others and eventually other uh, steps in domination would kind of mold in, in a in a particular way um, it would be the, the the hunger migration in fact in the same ninth century to to re to fill essentially the gap of the uh, that, that had been left by the the avar Kaganate. and um and there is in fact the the collapse also of the great moravia at that point but um today we concentrate mostly on, on the czechs that were in turn part of the subjects of of moravia but still being fundamentally at the border with the Ger german speaking uh, areas and at that point in fact in the ninth century uh, of eastern Francia so the 
probably the Carolingian Empire and eventually this, the, its su successor uh, kingdom uh, of, of would would become Germany essentially. And uh, always given that the kind of the ethnic map was different from from today, um, and more or less the the, the Germanic Slavic border was was constituted by the Elbe. But the Czechs were always more than other Slavs exposed to the Germanic influence, and as we will see now, the Bohemians were extremely clever to to interplay like between these um, overlapping dominations that were naturally in, in contrast with each other, and in turn uh, developing the, their own domination from the core land of the, the Bohemian of the Bohemian territory, um, and the Great Moravia had been very important um, during the 9th century because um, it was a land of uh, contention, let's say, between the um, between Constantinople and Rome, right? There was uh, at one point this um, Slavic liturgy and um, Latin liturgy conflicting uh, with each other and uh, for natural um, matters of control who had to organize the ecclesiastical hierarchy and how, right, there were still pagan resistance uh, in, in turn, but of course the the future was Christianization, especially Christianization, as we've seen many times in Schwerpunkt, is, the, uh, is vehiculated by the elites, who by building a diocesan model are substantially strengthening their actual territorial infrastructures, the um, basically bringing to the complete sanitarization of these uh, tribal entities and establishing therefore a type of government that also probably the majority of, of, of freemen w weren't very very fond of and that however also in that sense was the future because broader clientele more structured um, in segmented uh, stratified mm, politics and policy and society brings to you know something more, more consistent that can have a higher uh, political uh, weight, right? Um, and on the other hand, between the direct dependence on the Church of Rome and the ecclesiastical integration within the metropolitan province of Salzburg, right? There was a competition between, in fact, Rome that had partly vehiculated the same Christianization of Moravia, telling the truth, and the local um, Germanic powers, like especially Bavaria, that as we will see will have a kind of a troubled history, but um, with uh, strange relations, let's say, with um, with Bohemia, uh, but also in part actually back in it at some point, and, but we will see it better observing Ottonian policy. And the disgregation of Moravia brought Moravia proper under the uh, major domination that was somewhat decentralized but however direct um, while the dynasts that had arisen in Bohemia where the population was also by the way in part in large part politicist still mm, sought help from from the Hungarian attacks in the political subordination to the Teutonic Kingdom and um, as a consequence they also favored the uh, Germanic uh, evangelization activity, right? And um, as a consequence, there were, in fact, in Bohemia, uh, political and religious uprisings that um, brought, actually, to the repressive interventions of the Germans up to the mid-10th century, when, as we will see, Otto I would manage to definitively subdue the premisnets, um and um, especially considering Bohemia as a potential aid actually against certain other formations that were kind of threatening the same Ottonian unity at one point. Um, and in turn, in fact, Otto recognized the premisnets, the right to rule within the region. Right. So, as we'll see it better later, this is actually a pretty uh, common practice of you know, rec recognizing the, the impossibility of ruling over regions that objectively were pretty, you know, still warlike. They were uh, unstable already on their own. They were finding stabilization, in fact, just with this 
uh, dynasties that had managed somewhat to rise and to um, enucleate into a, a leading um, family, right, in that um, were easier to control from the distance and their uh, situation that was uh, precarious, not just because of internal uh, oppress, but also of, of external intervention. Uh, the Poles at this point also created problems to, to, to Bohemia, especially at the end of the century. But uh, all of these factors shaped, molded what would become, in fact, the, the same monarchy, right? Uh, at this point, the Bohemians were known as duchess, that is, the, the military title usually referred, in fact, to the strictly military commanders, a title recognized by an emperor who therefore had the faculty to recognize a military ruler um, within I its own uh, domination. It was naturally a patronizing provision that actually means that the Germans never came to rule in Bohemia, uh, albeit they, they managed definitely to, to impose their, their dominance uh, by making the permissless paying tributes, etc. But the uh, occupying it w w was unfeasible, it was not even convenient. More than else, it was needed to have a, a referential point in there that could be recognized by the same imperial authority in exchange for some sort of fealty, and this would bring essentially Bohemia into the Holy Roman Empire. And this is very interesting because the Bohemian Duchy would become, as a matter of fact, a kingdom, hmm, uh, officially. Uh, this was, however, always subordinated within the Teutonic Kingdom, right? So I think this is actually the first time I've learned of this, and I was convinced that Bohemia was a, you know, was a kingdom on its own in the sense of naturally, uh, on a neutral institutional level, but like, I don't know, there was the Kingdom of Germany, the Kingdom of Bohemia, the Kingdom of Italy, the Kingdom of Burgundy, etc. But Bohemia, as we know, will would remain framed within uh, the Holy Roman Empire, also when it kind of acquired a more um, strictly, this acquired a more strictly Germanic character, and um, so it's complicated also because there is the imperial title in the middle, also the one of the King of the Romans, that technically also the Bohemians came to, to cover, but that point was sober uh, monarchic. So I'm, I'm not actually sure that there was this um, subordination to the uh, Teutonic Kingdom a as such. It's obvious, though, that the fact of Bohemia was at some point w uh, weaker right, than, um, than the Germanic, uh, the, the German monarchy, but not always, telling the truth, in the 13th century, especially in the second half of it, it would become the, effectively the largest power in in um, in Central Europe, right, and even more than, than the actual German kings. But the, um, and I'm talking about the late Premislit era, before the Luxembourgs, actually. Um, but aside from this, the important is that Bohemia went incorporated also not just politically and institutionally but also culturally within the uh, the Holy Roman Empire more specifically in the Germanic area in the fo following centuries of the, as we we have seen also in other videos it would be uh, massive Germanic migration Bohemian lands was also welcomed by the same monarchs that needed to, to bring in as many communities and as, as many um, let's say competitors as possible that could have as a point of reference, the, the monarchy and and backing it against the especially the nobility that of course instead stressed by the foe the sense of uh, autonomy this idea that, that they were all free at the beginning and that the king was just a primus inter pares etc. But uh, it's important to observe this story in the 10th century because a few years after the uh, submission, the mm, Premislid Bohemian uh, duke not only cooperated with the victory of Otto I over the Hungers, but also um, essentially gained from it in order to expand on Moravia, right? That at that point was freed by the Hunger um, uh, domination, and even in, uh, into Silesia and Slovakia, and up to the High Vistula, 
in those lands there would be eventually the one of the southern poles right uh, over which the, already the, the, the Moravians back in the day had exercised during the 9th century their own influence and were only in the 10th century began um, to emerge the, the city of, of Krakow that would become in fact the, the most important Polish um, s city and capital of the king and Polish kingdom uh, afterwards and uh, it's at this point in 10th century that Bohemia s sees the, the organization of its own ecclesiastical hierarchy of Latin right that had its most meaningful expression in the creation of the diocese uh, the uh, diocese of Prague it was subordinated though to the archbishop of Mainz in in the in Franconia uh, in Rhineland actually um, and uh, rather than to the one of Salzburg right in harmony now with the diminished political weight of the Bavarians within the Teutonic Kingdom um, that uh, essentially had come to be dominated instead by this uh, Saxon Franconian um, union under the Deutonians. So now let's pass to observe a, a bit more in detail what the, this whole thing is about. So f first of all, why Bohemia? Like, territorially speaking, you can already observe that uh, the Bohemian plain is blessed by this convenient position uh, in the center of Europe, first of all. So objectively at the crossroad of, of many many important countries between east and west north and south um, and uh, the mm, and also by natural conditions which favor and have favored from centuries human settlement right bohemia lies in the basin of the river vlatva which flows into the elbe right and uh, and it is surrounded on almost all sides by belts of mountains which also strategically speaking is quite important because it kind of preserves uh, the the core lands from also from invasions etc um, and uh, the central part of bohemia uh, in the lower reaches of the vlatva was occupied by the czechs in, in the narrow sense of the word who extended northward to the rivers Elbe and Order uh, spatially. And the main towns at this point were Prague, in fact, and the associated town of Bizarad, uh, Tetin, Kadzin, uh, Libusin, um, Levi, uh, Radek, I, I think it's called, and uh, Drevich. I don't know exactly the pronunciation of, the, uh, of these names, so uh, I ask for pardon in advance uh, for any inconvenience. And um, the Czechs had the greatest influence on the fate of the whole country, indeed, uh, giving it their name and enjoying um, uh, this dominant status within it during historical times. And in, in the East, however, the Czechs shared uh, the border with the Tzlikani, um, whose settlements lay between the rivers uh, Sadzava and the Elbe. And the, their main towns were the Stara Kurim and Lipice. And to the north of these, there were the eastern and western Croatian settlements that stretched through the upper basin of the Elbe as far as the Izera Pass. And between the western Croats and the Czechs dwelt a small tribe of mm, the Psovi, uh, uh, from the, the, the main town of Psovi, I think it's called, um, later called Melnik. And according to the sources, there were uh, three smaller tribes north of the Czechs as well, the Little Mary, the Dekani or the Tani, uh, and the Lemuns. And they inhabited both banks of the Elbe, which in that region flows through the Sudeten mountains. And their main towns were uh, Little Merice, uh, Datsin, and Bilinia. And to the Czechs west on both banks of the river Ora lived a Lucanic, um, m people known from their main town Zatek and uh, as Sedlitzenses and further west lived the Sedlitzane uh, of Sedlitz. Uh, the geography of the southern Bohemian tribes is very un unclear um, this should be probably un un be understood in the light of early domination 
of this part of the country by the, the Czechs and it seems that the Dulebi played the main part among the tribes which first inhabited the region. So you understand here a quite complex political pattern before the uh, unification, let's say, brought by the, the Premisla domination that of course took time and was never quite definitive. There were difficulties to, to frame certain areas. Uh, Moravia, for example, kind of always failed a bit on, on its own and rose against the same Premislid rule, etc. But there are also many other, uh, more specifically, you know, kind of internal uh, reasons of the nobility, uh, chiefly, and also of foreign intervention that um, destabilized the system. And um, But as we have seen before, this would lead to a progressive consolidation on, on the long run uh, from the side uh, of this dynasty. So, in, to make the long story short, actually, the unification of these areas was achieved exactly in this moment, I mean, between the 8th and the 10th uh, centuries. Uh, to the reign of Boleslav I, uh, 929-35 to 72, we can, we can date the subordination of the wall of the Bohemian uh, plain to by by the Czechs, from the, you know, loosely, like, the, the, the we don't have many certainties on how this concretely happened, and of course th there, there is uh, always a margin of, uh, you know, of, of a loose margin, let's say, but um, until this time the, the Czechs had controlled only central Bohemia directly, now they, they managed to expand um, all over, and um, eventually Boleslav II brought to the elimination of the Slav naked power in Libice in 995, and which can be mm, seen as the complexion of, of the process, right? Um, and, however, especially with what concerns the Slav naked's power um, and its political position, we, we can't scope uh, the, the world picture correctly, th there is some academic dispute about it, uh, some believe that this um, Slav um, Nikit territory covered the whole eastern Bohemia and was a completely separated uh, entity, while other scholars, probably more realistic, uh, regard this area as somewhat smaller and uh, at any rate mm, the, the Slav Nikits probably occupied the lands close to the Zlikhan and a threat um, and, and, and threat the, the power of the Slav Slavnik clan as a usurpation of the higher prince's right. Uh, uh, from from that time, the political unity of Bohemia, and this is really important, was never actually put to the test. Right, uh, the country did not follow the path of disintegration through dynastic partition, like you can see, for example, in, in Poland, uh, you know, it's, of course, uh, Bohemia is more compact and it's kind of also better geographically uh, framed, but the, the, this is not to be given for granted, however, in, in moments like these, up to, you know, during the 11th century, and, and etc. So, um, you can say that uh, even uh, at the beginning of the 11th century, the long-lasting union between Moravia and Bohemia was established uh, as well, and and the question is how did they make it right? Um, well, there is not a deterministic answer, but of course there were factors that favored this uh, concentration of power. Uh, definitely, Bohemia is famous for its mines, especially of silver, and um, in in this picture, Prague uh, dominated the in Bohemia as a wall and uh, as a city in particular was a center of l rulership that came to surpass all other bohemian fortifications right uh, in the l especially from last third of the ninth century um, and kept developing during the course of the tenth right and also with the extended suburbium of the um, Malastrana on the Vlatva right um, to uh, essentially an inland trading center in which, um, in the words of um, Ibrahim ibn Yaqub and the Rus and the Slavs from the city of Krakow um, and the Muslims and Jews from the lands of the Turks, 
um, here essentially the the Khazar lands came together in a polyethnic market similar to those of the maritime trading centers of the Baltic region um, and this witnesses the the international importance of this trade center um, and favored by by its position um, uh, geographically speaking on, on, at the center of fact of very important intercontinental routes mm -hmm. um, and a very important path was e evidently also the one of Christianization right which favored as we were saying before decentralization of power uh, the sacralization of the monarchy that was actually very important especially since it could confer this hour of sacrality to a power that was essentially devoid of previous uh, political bases and institutional continuities and especially in, in a context that that had been recently Christianized and the bohemian princes who first accepted Christianity often played uh, a key role as did um, Venceslas, Boleslav I, and Boleslav uh, II. Pope Benedict III, ruling between 855 and 858, received um, the great missionaries to the Slavs, uh, Constantine, Cyril, uh, and Methodius, in Rome, and he and his successor supported them, not least against the bishops of Bavaria, as we've seen before, who were profoundly jealous uh, at the successful growth of the churches in Bohemia and Moravia. Furthermore, Rorivoy and his wife Ludmila were baptized together with their son Spitnev by Archbishop Methodius himself at the court of Sviatopluk. And in 895, however, the same Spitnev uh, that ruled in Bohemia renewed Moravia's allegiance with the Franks uh, and it has been conjectured that the jurisdiction of the Bishop of Regensburg was extended into Bohemia. Naturally, going a bit deeper, Bohemian unification was speeded up by the pressure from the Eastern Frankish Kingdom in the West and from the Great Moravia in the East. Right? Bohemia laid in the middle and they made it um, possible to essentially s survive and consolidate uh, at the outskirts of these two dominations. Right? Um, our oldest sources for Bohemia predated the rise of Moravia, right? You know, between the 800 that was between 833 and finishing begin beginning of the 10th century, essentially, and. There are references in Frankish sources in 791, uh, 805, where Charlemagne himself actually led uh, military offensives against the Bohemian Slavs in 817 and 822 that suggests a loose Frankish hegemony over Bohemia itself. Uh, however, this domination was weakened by the Frankish crisis of the 30s of the 9th century and the situation uh, changed. Of course, um, the Franks, as you know, launched several offensives along the Elbe River and, and beyond um, in, in Slavic territory. We can't think of an actual Frankish uh, rule in these lands. But, of course, these were the, the weaker sides, like the, the Carolingian Empire being the, the, the giant here, and therefore this Western Slavs ended up in gravitating around uh, around the, the Frankish world. And this was not just due to the threat of invasion that naturally speeded up the process of uh, structuration of political and military structures, um, but also for the, the same uh, cooptation of Slavic elites, as we have seen, in 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 the allegiance to to the empire and uh, also taking from the Germanic areas this um, more stratified um, political and social organization that the Carolingians had brought uh, in in lands like Germany that you know in certain areas were objectively that very different from the Slavic ones politically and socially with the idea of uh, freemen. Um, ship, we can say, um, and this egalitarian political culture. It was just about elites, but elites that were much less powerful than the ones you could find in Frank and that now were reshaping in a true political and social engineering the uh, lands. And the 
of that they had conquered. So the Slavs were not conquered in this sense. At least, just some areas actually were, um, especially in lands like uh, that had belonged uh, previously even to the the other domination, etc. So um, certain areas were were also Germanized. Think about the southeastern Mark from which Austria w would emerge. They, they, those were largely Islamic areas at some point. Um, and the uh, and the, and it's not also very easy to understand who was who at, at, at certain points, but the, the Slavic elites uh, were very very attracted, very receptive to the Frankish models because they represented what they they hadn't had never had in their own land, where that they had always had to to contend with other with the other aristocrats for power and that they didn't know this more stratified and hierarchical uh, political structure. So um, the the exposure to Frankish culture as brutal as it violent it could be um, in, in warfare but it was also played at a political level um, in, in in and also at an economical one. I mean these systems entered in in, in uh, into broader economical circuits as we have commercial um, circuits in general um, that as we have seen before in that uh, were uh, that were vehiculating also other um, you know other through material culture cultures certain m similar models also of more stratified lands um, in eight hundred in the summer of eight hundred fourteen, we know that Louis de Pius had organized the Frankish sub kingdoms, among which Bavaria was named for the first time. And three years later, he issued the uh, Ordinatio Imper. And Louis' namesake, known to historians under a title whose inaccuracy is sanctioned by tradition as Louis the German, received uh, as kingdom Bavaria, the Corinthians, the Bohemians and the others as well as the Slavs who live in the east of Bavaria. So here the Frankish rule in the east was extended to encompass uh, these populations including Bohe the Bohemians um, and other Slavs who lived in the east of Bavaria, also the others that in part surely had remained uh, in the area. Um, and this is quite important because it, it makes you understand what the, the Frankish perspective really was about the eastern frontier. I mean, there was a clear idea that uh, the, uh, the the Frankish domination had to extend towards that direction, that these peoples were conquerable, that, uh, they, that there was also, objectively, as we, we know, in Central Europe, there isn't quite of a real um, geographical barrier. Like, of course, we have seen, like with Bohemia before, there is a particular um, dimension that can be outlined, physically in, uh, in, in, in in its geography, but um, at the same time these mm, spaces are pretty pretty loose, that they, they can uh, be encompassed by several uh, dominations, and especially they, uh, the, the lack of local political and social certifications favors the creation of this broader uh, nominal domination sometimes. Think about the Great Moravia, what was, what was it? What actually did remain of it, right? That there are, of course, something remained, but these were experiments. Like, like for example, think about the the kingdom of Samo back in the day. Uh, the, these formations that emerged because of certain particularly favorable conditions that, however, lacked a more coherent and systematic structure. That, however, has always to be identified at that point in in the consensus that existed locally speaking because the more uh, the, the situation is um, you know is loose and, and more you, if you want to rule you need someone at, at the base supporting you because there aren't many other political structures as they would form later in in feudalism and the uh, the eastern frontier of, uh, of of the Carolingian Empire was actually quite troubled right that the, there is this chapter of military history that we we often overlook because also we, we know fairly a few about it telling the truth um, but that was very important like the, the germanic slavic frontier was pretty damned hard and violent and and and, and tough chapter that witnesses the resistance that the, the slavs definitely managed to oppose to the, the carolingians you know the slavs also militarily speaking 
in the West were stereotypically pictured as, you know, fanatic defenders, you know, pretty tough. There were many. They had a demographic strength with a lack of a more structured um, political authority. They, they compensated with, with higher uh, combativity. Um, at a tribal level, and they, they, they struck back. You know, the, the Carolingians had the big guns, they had develop, they were developing heavy cavalry, etc. But, you know, th- this is not the moment in which uh, cav- heavy cavalry really takes over yet. The, the infantry is still dangerous. These lands are, by the way, pretty wild because they're, they, they haven't met the urbanization, deforestation. They're, they're still developing. So, these guys know that their their territory. They know where they can. So it, it was very, very tough ground. And we we have references to campaigns against the Bohemians in the late 40s and the 50s of the 9th century, um, and occasional references during the next 40 years, which imply that the Bohemians were at this point still mm, as much under Moravian. Uh, as under Frankish control, which means that basically nobody uh, managed to fully control uh, this area, and that they switched allegiance according to you know to to, to convenience, of course. In eight eight hundred forty five, we know that f- uh, fourteen Bohemian duchess. So here, multiple um, uh, chieftains, multiple leaders were baptized in Regensburg. Now, this is important because it, it shows definitely the deep political ties that, that were being established also with the Bohemian aristocracy from the, from the Frankish side. And the uh, and the and Christianization definitely is a step for the further integration of these the peoples in, in the broader, let's say, imperial um, ensemble. And uh, ten years later, uh, troops from Bavaria and Count Ernst, in, uh, we're talking about 855, uh, in fact, and the king himself, right, uh, the king of Eastern Francia, in 856 this time, forced the Bohemians to pay tribute. At this point, Louis the German even planned to conquer Slav territories outside the established frontiers, um, but uh, at most he sought a kind of suzerainty over Moravia and Bohemia. Right at this point, the, the Eastern Frankish Kingdom w- was in trouble. I mean, the, the the problem were more the outer Carolingians than the actual uh, than the Slavs as such, or at least they were on equal grounds. And and of course, pushing too far in the east was, was unfeasible for the aforementioned reasons. But at least there was this. Realization that the eastern frontier had some to be somewhat secured, and if this couldn't be achieved by arms, it at least it could be achieved by diplomacy with, with an agreement. Um, and only in 890 did, let's say, all the Bohemian princes, according to the sources, appear before King Arnulf of Eastern Francia, and two of them were. Primores and uh, victorious princes, right? The uh, they were Spitnev and and Vitislav, and this um, ex- highlights, like just like the previously uh, some uh, generation before those fourteen duchess, right? That uh, Bohemia was still undergoing at this point uh, a process of consolidation, um, uh, where. Power wa- was effic- effectively shared uh, 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 in the region by by several, um, you know, chieftains, and uh, that were, however, progressively uh, forming supra-tribal or organizations. Hmm? And later on, in eight uh, eight hundred eighty four, in eight hundred eighty five, Arnulf was compelled to make peace. Mm-hmm. Surrendering Bohemia and maybe even parts of Pannonia to Svatopluk. Right here, Moravia is still a thing, um, and it's it's capable of essentially um, presenting a counterpart to 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 Frankish rule in, in the area. Um, and the Bohemian at once, uh, 895, did homage the. Frankish king, but again, some of the Bavarian nobles had sided uh, 
with the Moravians of a more central and northern German rule that in a few decades would be embodied in fact by the Ottonians that as we will see were dramatically important for also for the same development of the of the Bohemian uh, Dutch. The, the relations with the Ottonians were, were, were strained as well. You can say that the, the Bohemians paid uh, a somewhat regular tribute to the Ottonians, right? Um, that was discontinued uh, in, uh, in, uh, at some point, right? Um, and this happened both with the Bohemians and the Poles, telling the truth, that also had uh, interference in Bohemian affairs, especially towards the end of the, of the 10th century, but throughout all this period they, they also were uh, part of this broader fluid Western Islamic uh, area that still needed to, to find the, the actual centers of balance. And from the threat, uh, the treaty, the, the treaty, excuse me, of 921, until the death of Henry the First, the Fowler, in 936, the Bavarian Duke fought against the Bohemians, both at the side of the king and on his own account. So naturally, the Ottonians uh, tried to. Th they emerged t consolidating the Eastern frontier as well. So this brought to warfare also with the same Bohemians. But um, the pressure from Germany uh, became difficult to resist uh, f for, for the Bohemians, especially after the rise of the Ludolfings. Wenceslas I fostered close relations with the Bavarians. Right? Uh, in the campaign of 928-29, Henry uh, I defeated Wenceslas and compelled him to pay tribute, compelling him to, to submit. Uh, this failure provoked Wenceslas' younger brother, Boleslav I, to mount a coup, uh, kill his brother and seize power. And as early as the 10th century, the Bohemian Church recognized uh, Wenceslas as a saint and was to become the national patron saint, a very important uh, uh, religious figure and in locally. And Boleslav first had to overcome some unnamed rival, named as Subregulus in, in, the, in the area, that was aided by the Saxons and the Thuringians at this point were against them. And for a long time Boleslav kept his distance from the Germans, maintaining contacts with the Polabian Slavs and even allowing the Hungars to pass through his lands to uh, invade Thuringia. So you see that at this beginning, the, the actually the relations with the Ottonians were quite, uh, quite bad, quite strained, um, because the Bohemians at this time still thought they could maintain essentially a balance, and uh, albeit of course not uh, intervening too directly also in German affairs because it would have been too, too dangerous. And Boleslav at this point was of dramatic importance because he spent this time constructing defense outposts and later to be the kernels of urban or your organization in Bohemia. Uh, the collapse of Moravia at the beginning of the 10th century freed Bohemia from Moravian domination, but it also deprived her of the Moravian counterbalance in her dealings with eastern Franks. This is particularly significant and it might have been around then or a little later under Boleslav I in, in the 40s of the 10th, 10th century that the Bohemians expanded through the girdle of mountains into Silesia and Little Poland that um, had been under Moravian domination at that point so the Bohemians were the most ready to fill that gap. But in the mid 10th century the picture uh, changes again because uh, the Ottonians managed to uh, uh, obtain successes in Nordgau against the Hungarian invaders and they launched this large-scale counter-attacks against uh, the Magyars in 950, penetrating deep into Hungary herself. Um, and it's at this moment that in the same year that Bohemia was placed under ducal rule in a revival of traditional Carolingian policy. Right. Uh, in 950, 
the Bohemian Duke had to submit to Otto I. And in 955, actually, the Bohemians f fought with the Germans against the Hungarians themselves. And this relationship of dependence on Germany forced um, the, uh, on the Bohemians to, that would turn out to be long uh, last. So what happened in here is that the Hungarians have collapsed under the actually before the Bavarian and eventually the the Saxon um, strikes and this mm, important regional power gets resized and Bohemia that at, up to this point had remained fundamentally in between uh, the the Hungars and, and the Franks uh, finds itself. Uh, sucked into the uh, the Eastern Frankish Kingdom in the, the imperial orbit. Um, this is important because it this actually happened with the same Hungary, right? It was kind of more distant at this point decides even to, to convert um, in a, in some generations to to Christianity and to settle down definitely and to stop its raids, uh, etc. Naturally, Bohemia is a kind of more modest power and uh, is even closer to Germany, and and there at this point is is firmly stable uh, under under its control. Of course, there were, as we will see now, certain you know backs and forths, given also the the, the structuration of other uh, Islamic dom uh, dominations, such as like the, the the Polish ones that also tried to to interfere in Bohemia. But it it this is an important turning point because. Um, it, at this point, the uh, the the great mm, you know the, the connection, the strong bond, let's say, that had existed with the Franks since the uh, at the times of Charlemagne, at this point is re-tied with the stabilization of uh, of the the Holy Roman Empire in, in with its center in Germany, and and this broader and um, definitive. Uh, building of local monarchical institutions uh, at this point so Bohemia unavoidably um, gravitating gravitating around it right and um, Henry the second of Bavaria ruling discontinuously between uh, 955 and 995 uh, tries to to dispose um, his cousin Otto the second and organized several uprisings in alliance with Mieszka of Poland and Boleslav the second of Bohemia. This is yet another inversion of the trend uh, because here the Ottonians are in trouble. There is essentially two uh, sides of of the of two branches uh, of the dynasty. One centered in kind of Saxony, Franconia, and the other one in Bavaria. Um, and at this point, the um, the the Ottonian rule is entering crisis that would be uh, especially stronger when Otto II died and his uh, son was a minor and his wife Theophanus uh, was uh, you know was a regent and this sparked the Bavarian revival. That uh, the Bavarians are a bit the the unsung. Um, winners of the, the fight against the Hungarians, actually before the uh, the Battle of Lackfeld, the, um, the the Bavarians had worn out the the Hungars and pro probably broken their uh, at the core their offensive capabilities. And then Otto the First arrives and he makes all of this great historical historiographical propaganda. Um, to, to stress the fact that how they had already won, but of course the Battle of Riada in 933, also from from, from his father, uh, had been quite important. So we don't have to, um, you know, underestimate it at this point the, uh, the 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 unity of the same Germanic Empire is uh, is is undermined. The Ottonians actually don't rule exactly, not even Germany. Uh, entirely right, but the important thing here is that uh, uh, two countries like Poland and Bohemia have as a point of reference Germany, whatever it is, whether it's Saxony or Bavaria, and at this point they prefer to strengthen this bond with the um, the Bavarian branch of the Ottonian dynasty, and we can see 
that Henry himself was proclaimed king by his supporters at the Easter celebrations of 984 in Quedlinburg, and among these supporters there were the Dukes Boleslav of Bohemia and Mieszko of Poland, as well as the Abodrit Prince Mistu. Um, in almost every year of her regency, that was essentially between 983 until her death in 990, Teofanu, widow of Otto II, um, ruling on behalf of her son Otto III, organized campaigns in the Elb Slav territories and often participated um, herself, which is remarkable. And these uh, campaigns were conducted in alliance with Duke Mieszko of Poland, who did homage Otto III in 986, so essentially uh, passing from the other side of the Ottonian branch in terms of allegiance. And Saxon and Polish forces at this point cooperated against Bohemia too. And Bohemian Duke Boleslav II in turn concluded an alliance with the Lutetsk Confederation. And here the conflicts between the Polish Piasts and the Bohemian Permislits became visible. From about 990 the two families fought for lordship over Silesia and Krakow and uh, in the last resort for hegemony over the whole area of West Slav settlement uh, overall. And there was also a third family that was concerned in these rivalries that were the Bohemian Slavnikids that we have met before and who in fact were uh, of some importance for Tonian Eastern policy and provided the Bishop of Prague in the person of the subsequently canonized St. Adalbert, as an extremely important figure uh, in European spirituality of the, uh, of the time. And for the Ottonian policy, um, the expansion of the Polish realm of the Piasts was actually uh, great. And in parallel happened different dynamics, for example, uh, the menace of the Czech realm of the Permislids in Bohemian by Poland, but at the same time um, the persecution of the Slav Nikids in Bohemia by the Permislids. This led the Bohemians to seek for a eastwards expansion and establishing relations that reached as far as the Kievan Rus. Uh, Boleslav II's son, Boleslav, married a daughter of the Grand Duke Vladimir. Um, and also relations with Poland were however soon set on a proper footing and the leaders of both polities willingly cooperated with the German Regency 983 too in an attack on the Polabian Slavs in the north. So this collaboration with the Ottonian dynasty which dates back to 978 was preceded by cooperation be between the Bohemian ruler along with the Polanian Duke uh, Mieszko and Henry of Bavaria. Also, Boleslav II's wife, Emma, was a bo of Bavarian descent herself, and his brother, Strakvas, became a monk in Regensburg, which shows the familial ties of also within the ecclesiastical aristocracies of these great dynasties. And um, by 995, Boleslav had concluded the political unification of the Bohemian plain, uh, uh, this process already significantly advanced by Boleslav I. And this um, uh, was achieved uh, by Boleslav through actually the violent elimination of the Slavnikia dukes based in Libice in eastern Bohemia. And this can be considered not just as a local but also as an international achievement given that the Slavnikia rule had been supported by Saxony and Poland and had not accorded with the aspirations of the government in Prague. And a few survivors of the Slav naked clan took refuge in Poland or Germany, uh, including the, the then Bishop of Prague, Adalbert Wojtek. Um, also, later on, Boleslav II took part in the renewed election by the Saxon princes in uh, 1002 at Merseburg, and with these acknowledged the new king, um, and at the beginning of uh, 1003, the Polish duke managed to seize Bohemia, but Henry demanded that um, Henry II th that he should do homage for the Bohemian dukedom, which Boleslav refused. And uh, Henry 
at this point pre prevented the incorporation of Bohemia into the Piast Empire and did observe Ottonian overlordship over uh, Bohemia. Um, so, with the 11th century, we stopped this, but just reflect on how essentially this power always um, managed to. Um, um, to, to carve its own space and to, to maintain it more, more than else, to consolidate it and eventually managing to find its own dimension within, of course, uh, 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 someone else's domination in practice, but um, at the same time maintaining that degree of autonomy that would make Bohemia rising as a major um, power in Central Europe in, in, in the following centuries and uh, achieving quite important uh, feats uh, in, in Central Europe. Um, and for now we stop here. Uh, I hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it, otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming contents. And for now, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.